We now turn to the issue of access to electricity, which remains at the forefront of daily concerns in Africa. A report by the International Energy Agency has just flagged a persistent situation of power outages and load shedding in several countries on the continent last year. These mainly include Egypt, Nigeria, South Africa, Madagascar and Kenya, where a nearly 24-hour blackout affected around 50 million people last August. To discuss these challenges, but also the continent's prospects, we spoke in Joburg with Angi Ayuk, the president of the African Energy Chamber. Listen to him. Angi Ayuk, what do you think as measures the national administration should take now to deal with this persisting low level of electricity access in Africa? We need to take immediate action on this crisis. The climate crisis and energy poverty need to be addressed both. They're two sides of the same coin. So every country right now in Africa has to prioritize providing energy access, electricity. But let me step back and let's look at Africa as a whole. 600 million Africans don't have access to electricity. 900 million don't have access to clean cooking technologies, most of them women. That is no longer a luxury issue, it's a human rights issue. But then we cannot wait for someone to do it for us. We need to include that in the budget and cut some waste and really drive up even gas to power projects and drive up other kind of projects to really provide energy access because you know what? When we t tackle this energy problem, it increases jobs, it increases growth because manufacturing and everything that needs that baseload energy that needs to happen. African nations need to ramp up budgets. They need to ramp up financing for energy access projects immediately because it's a crisis that needs immediate attention right now in the continent. There is a paradox. The continent produces a lot of oil. Still, there are often queues and shortages at petrol stations, and fuel is expensive all over the continent. How do you explain this outcome, and what can be done? We never built refineries in the continent. We never looked at refined products. Oil was produced in Africa for Western markets. We did not see Africa as a market. And when we, had, when we had a market, we had governments controlling everything and regulating too much so the private sector didn't have a chance to walk right in. This, is, this has changed though. We even had a moment where we would send crude oil from Africa to Europe to be refined, then brought back in Africa. So we were paying high prices at the pump beyond market rates because we needed these products to live our daily lives. Now we've seen big, massive projects, the single largest project and refinery that has been built in Africa and across the world with new technology, the Dan Cote refinery that is going to be doing a lot, about 650,000 barrels we could process a day. There is, there is still, there is hope, but we need to build more. In East Africa, there are challenges. In West Africa, there's still challenges. But also there's going to be challenges to get crude into, that, into, into those refineries. That's why we need to ramp up production to take care of African energy security, but we need to do it in a sustainable way. Because when you do it in a sustainable way, we become good stewards of the environment too, and we also meet our climate challenge as we've been required, because it's, it's called global warming, not Africa warming. So you need a global solution, and Africa is part of this solution in order to make and encourage that but we need to also encourage local refining capacity rather than us waiting for european refiners to refine products and to do refined products and bring it into africa you advocate that even if africa supports global efforts toward energy transition natural gas should remain in the mix how to combine energy transition and renewable energy on the one hand and economic development with the potential of Africa's gas reserves on the other? It's very easy. Natural gas is the cleanest fossil fuel out there. But then also pay attention to this. If you produce all of Africa's natural gas, Africa's greenhouse gas emissions are 2.73% compared to um, or when you look at the Global Climate Atlas, you, Africa's greenhouse gas emission would increase by 0.67%, not even up to 1% if you produce all Africa's natural gas. But natural gas affords Africa the base load um, energy that it would need to drive up power. But it's not just about power, it's about also looking at petrochemicals. 
we'll be able to produce manufacturing through by using our own fertilizer, urea, ammonia, NPK, fertilizer plants, and we'll be able to produce food. So we don't have to deal with go to Russia and Ukraine to beg for food. And you want to tell poor people in Africa with no access, with nothing, that they shouldn't use cheap, affordable, baseload energy to grow their lives? I think there is a whole lot of disconnect. The EU, the European Union, says natural gas is green energy, the same as, as renewables. Why is it green energy for Europe and it's not green energy for poor people in Africa? I think that's unfair. Nuclear energy is a direction that some countries, such as Burkina Faso, are considering to take now. Is nuclear energy an option for Africa as a whole? It is an option, but also you have to deal with the huge capital expenditures. We need to figure out how to finance that. And if you're able to finance that, then it works. But also, there's also an alternative which you can go with using SMRs, small, um, um, small modular reactors, to really be able to drive and drive and get long-term projects going with nuclear. That's something that African states should really consider because we have to have all of the above energy solutions, given where we are right now. We're in a crisis. We're in a crisis. So when you're in a crisis, you use what you have to get what you want. All of their both energy solutions and nuclear offers hope for Africa. NGI Yuk, thank you very much. Thank you so much. It's an honor.